I will be reading the scriptures uh, from the lesson in the book of Romans, chapter 13, 7 through 8. Give to everyone what you owe them. Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them. And give respect and honor to those who are in authority. Owe nothing to anyone except for your obligation to love one another. If you love your neighbor you will fulfill the requirements of God's law. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you. Years ago, there was a circus in Europe, a traveling circus. And in that circus, there were trapeze artists, there were magicians, uh, there, were, there were animals, there was everything that you would expect to see at a circus. One attraction that people uh, abused, I think, was a, a brown bear in a cage. A cage that was about 12 foot long. This bear, day after day after day, would march a relentless, at a relentless pace in that 12 foot cage, that bear would go 12 foot forward and 12 foot back. 12 foot forward and 12 foot back. Each day, every day, the same thing. 12 foot forward, 12 foot back. It was a miserable existence. And people complicated and compounded the, the misery of that poor bear. They would flip cigarettes into the cage and when the bear would, would march at that cadence, he'd step on the cigarettes and the pads of his paws would be burned. They, they fed that bear trash uh, out of some rusty a pan or what have you. He drank water out of, out of a greasy, just a greasy basin. It was a miserable, miserable existence. Twelve foot forward and twelve foot back. It was a prison. It was an indescribable 
incarceration. And yet one day, one day, that bear was purchased by the, the Heidelberg Zoo. Now, the Heidelberg Zoo to a bear was paradise. Near, near millennial conditions. Acres and acres and acres of, of just rolling hills where this bear could run and play and there was other bears to have fellowship with. Three square meals and fountains just flowing with clear water all over that place. It was an incredible place. And the day came for that bear to move in. And they rolled that cage onto the grounds and they threw open the gate or the door, what have you, that, that wooden cage with its iron bars. And they threw open the, the door and there was freedom for this bear. And this bear that, that was on pace stopped at the door and looked out and turned. Twelve foot forward, and 12 foot back. Freedom right there. They tried to probe that, that bear out. It wouldn't move. It just kept, kept walking. Paid no attention. Just kept marching and marching. And finally they, they took a pole and they, and they wrapped uh, rags around the pole and, and dipped it in something like kerosene and uh, they set it aflame and it was giving off this black smoke and they stuck it in the cage and finally the cage filled with that black smoke and the bear somehow ended up outside the cage. And it was just there outside and freedom, freedom. And when it kind of got its bearings, it began to walk again. Twelve foot forward and twelve foot back. It was free, but it kept that same pace. Because you see, the prison for that bear was not metal, it was mental. Some of the happiest people I've ever met are Christians. And some of the most miserable people I've ever met are Christians. And yet we have this incredible freedom. You know, that, that our freedom is in Christ. And yet we seem to go 12 foot forward and 12 foot back. Same old things, same old worries, same old trials, same old, same old life. Just miserable existence. Amazing. It's amazing. Now, when we think about freedom, as we've been doing uh, the last few weeks and the weeks before I showed up, I inherited this, uh, this series, and it's a good series. You've talked about a lot of things, and when you think about freedom uh, and, and things that you are seeking, um, you know, uh, we're bound today. We can talk about freedom from drugs or alcohol or attitudes or anger our freedom in relationships. You know, it can go on and on and on, and you can talk about it. And today, we're looking at freedom from debt. Now, let me give you a few statistics on this. The average American household income is around $50,000 a year. And 50% of Americans have credit card debt. I don't want a show of hands, but does everybody understand what we are saying here? The average credit card debt is $15,800, and most of us are doing our part. The average American spends 34% of income on housing. The average car payment for a new vehicle is $485 a month. The average American only saves $150 a month. 
54% of American workers have saved less than $25,000 for their retirement. The average American over their lifetime will pay over $600,000 in interest. Are you glad that you came this morning? <laughs> now, you know, we can approach that and give you a lot of ideas and, and try to draw up a plan for you and, and, and hope that you will commit to that plan. Um, if you look in your bulletin, you'll note that beginning in August, there will be a class taught by Les Heaton and Nathan Flora, and uh, this class is called uh, Financial Peace University. And, and it's one of the best avenues to become debt-free that you'll find today uh, that I believe is offered. And, and I encourage you, you can read that, uh, that note there in, in the bulletin. And, and if you know of anybody or, or you feel that way yourself, there's going to be a lot of folks in that class. And, and I hope that you will take advantage of that because it's just a much-needed thing. And that's why we are offering that. So, so I would encourage you that you'd find some avenue to, to get free in your debt. And we can talk a lot about that. But this morning, I thought about how should I approach this? If you look at your scripture, it's not just about debt and money, but it talks about a debt of love. And what I want to talk a few minutes on this morning is living in generosity placing yourself in a position to be a blessing. Are you with me? Now pay attention. Plug in. Why do we want to talk about generosity? Is, is this another commercial from the church? No, not really. Carl Menninger, a great psychiatrist of yesteryear, said, generosity is one of the essential components of mental health. We have found that generous people are rarely mentally ill. You know, we live in an age of contrast. When I look at a quote like that, uh, never has modern society uh, been so uh, wealthy in things that don't really matter and so poor in things that do. Isn't that amazing? And yet through generosity, it's, a, it's an avenue that can set us free. We got a lot of stuff. You ever walk through an old house? And, and uh, you walk through an old house, and in some of the rooms, they've got these tiny rooms. They're about like this. About like a, does anybody here remember? I'm going to ask some tough questions. Does anybody here remember a telephone booth? <laughs> you remember that? Some of you may, may remember typewriters and stuff. But anyway, anyway, telephone booth. You, you know, you go in, some of these houses have little rooms about the size of a, of a telephone booth, and you bring your kids, you take your kids into those houses, and they'll say, what is this room? And you say, honey, that's what they call the closet. I say, wow, how come it's so small? Because we got stuff. Don't we have stuff? Really? My, my little, uh, my daughter, our daughter, uh, when she was two years old, never forget this, she was talking to her mother one day, and, and her mother had, had bought these uh, pants for her, and, and uh, she stuck her hands in her pockets. And she'd never had pockets in her pants before. And she said, Mommy, I got pockets. And she's had pockets ever since. <laughs> you know that? You can't get enough in your pockets. So you know what, what we used to call garages. Y'all remember garages? They're not, now they're storage areas. <laughs> Isn't that right? And, and if they're not adequate, we, uh, we purchase these uh, cubicles. We put them out back so the neighbors won't notice. And so nobody will break in and bother our stuff. Isn't that right? We do that. Hello? You know that's true. And, and, and it's not enough that we purchase these areas, and, they, and now they've got, they've got fields of them. You know? And you get your own number. And sometimes they're air-conditioned. You know? It's amazing. And, and then we insure the stuff. We're not even sure what's there now, but we've got to make sure nobody gets our stuff. 
And then finally the day comes when we have what we call a yard sale. We sell it to some guy who goes and puts it in his garage. <laughs> a year later, he puts it in his driveway and we buy it back. <laughs> Look what I found, Mama. You know what I'm saying? It's our stuff. We need to talk about that. Is everybody on board? You know, uh, in Exodus chapter uh, chapters 3 and 4, Moses... Moses was out one day and uh, he was uh, just kind of doing his shepherding, you know. And he ended up talking to a plant. Does anybody here talk to plants? You know, it used to be pretty popular. This plant talked back. You remember it was, it was, it was burning and, and, and there was a conversation between the plant and we found out it was God speaking to Moses. And it finally came down to his staff or his shepherd Cain. And, and God said, throw down your staff. Now I've always, I found out through the years that that's a misspelled word. He didn't say throw down your staff. He really said, throw down your stuff. <laughs> because that's about all the stuff he had. And, and that was his favorite stuff. That one never ended up in the garage because that one, that, that one, he protected himself, he rested on it, he made his way through a tough terrain. That was an important thing, and God said, throw your stuff down. And he said, well, Lord, I... So he threw it down, if you remember, and it turned into a snake. And then God said, now, I, I'm from the hills, but you don't have to be from, from the hills to know you don't pick up those things. But anyway... <laughs> He, he finally picked it up, and when he picked it up, if you look at the Scripture, the Scripture will show you that, that before that occurrence, it was, it was Moses' stuff. But after that, it became the stuff of God. Read that. Or it was Moses' staff, but after that, it became the staff of God. Isn't that right? Check that out. Check that out. It's true. Because before we find that what we cling to, what we cling to is like a claim that we can do more with God's stuff than he can. But when we cast it down and when we pick it up and it's his stuff, then we begin to realize that it will do impossible things. It will feed the hungry halfway across the world. That stuff in our garages, that stuff in our cubicles, that stuff that we cling to suddenly will set people free. Isn't that awesome? Generosity. Let me share just a few things that I, that I wrote down, and, and I'll move quickly through this just to make a comment or two about generosity. Why do we want to live generous? I think one reason is it shows the character of God. The character of God. Y'all need, need a copy of my outline, and, and I think what I'll start doing is what I've done in, in, in ministry previously. Uh, put it in the bulletin so you can follow it easier, but today I'll just share a few things with you. But generosity displays God's character. The scripture goes like this in John 1 and verse 16 from the message. A version of scripture we all live off God's generous bounty gift after gift after gift first chronicles 29 everything has come from you Lord and we can only give you what is yours already wow that's the character of God I remember going through a McDonald's years ago when our daughter was was just a tiny thing and and we went through McDonald's and back then they, they had happy meals that had good food in it you know, now they, they put apples in it and stuff. But back then, you know, um, back then, when you bought a Happy Meal, um, it had the good stuff. Like, like, I ordered her a Happy Meal, and she, I handed it to her, and she opens it up, and, and, and uh, she takes the toy and tosses it to the side and reaches for the fries. Smart girl. So she pulls the fries out, and I reach for one. 
you know and she goes <laughs> and you know there was a part of me that wanted to lower my voice and say I am the source of your fries <laughs> you know what I'm saying you ever have that feeling or I could take those if I wanted them I could furnish a truckload of fries with a snap of a finger. But I didn't do that. You know, I didn't do that. And, and I think that's the way it is. When, when God provides us with a happy meal, we protect it. We pay extra to make sure no one breaks in and steals our fries, our stuff. We learn about the character of God, and, and, and uh, I think a second thing is that generosity defeats materialism. The scripture said, and Jesus said this in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, you cannot serve both God and money, a and, and that's the only antidote to materialism, is giving. When he says you can't serve God, and one version says mammon, uh, uh, more modern says money, uh, it says that because you can't have two number ones. So we make choices here. I think a third thing that, that generosity does, it draws me closer, uh, closer to God. You know, uh, um, the scripture says, your heart will be wherever your treasure is. That also is a sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6. Your heart will be wherever your treasure is. To get more interested in Coca-Cola, you buy stock in it. You invest in it. To get more interested, to get more interested in, uh, in Microsoft, you buy stock in it. You invest in it. To get more interested in your children, you invest in them. You spend time with them. You're there for them. You're there with them. You invest in them. Isn't that right? Hello? Isn't that right? Come out and play. Are you with me? Isn't that right? It is. And so it is with God. That, that to, quote, be interested in who he is and what he is doing, you invest in him and invest your life in him. I think another thing that generosity does, it deepens my joy. Jesus said, and, and, and Paul says this uh, to the elders of the, uh, uh, the church at Ephesus. This is from, ex, uh, from Acts chapter 20. But uh, he quotes Jesus, and he said, Jesus says there's more happiness in giving than in receiving. Wow. The most generous people I know are happy people, you know? They really are. And the happiest people I know are generous people. Think about that and think about your own life. Right along with this, my generosity and yours demonstrates my faith. Uh, the scripture says, your giving proves the reality of your faith. I'll give you an example of that. Uh, years ago, when Beth and I were just starting in ministry, and uh, we had this guy. We had this guy in the community. He was a great guy. Oh, he's a wonderful man, a very successful businessman. But when you really got down and talked with him, you see he had all kinds of problems in his life. And, and his life, his personal life, was in shambles. And I said to him, I said, uh, why don't you come to church? And uh, he said, if I walk in the door, the roof will cave in. And I said, well, you've got a construction company. You can fix it. I said, we're having a revival. We're having a revival, and it uh, starts tomorrow night. Why don't you come? He said, well, I'm busy. I said, well, get unbusy and come. And it's a long story, but he came the second night. I think it's a Monday night. Sunday or Monday night, I forget. I think it's the second night. And, and that night, uh, the guy preached, a close friend of mine, preached his heart out, and uh, Dave Knight. And, and when he gave an altar call that night, that guy was sitting in the very back. He made that long walk to the front of the church, knelt down. And, and you know, you think that's more than just exercise. When he made that long walk, he knelt down. He was ready to die at the altar. 
And he knelt down and received Jesus. Tears began to flow. And it was incredible. People couldn't believe it in the community. You know, everybody's looking, is that? And, 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 and they're seeing if it's him, you know. And there is weeping. And finally, when I prayed him, you know, prayed with him and, quote, prayed him through, he looked up at me and he said, whatever you want. You can have it. You know, to say that to a Methodist preacher, <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a risk. Now, I've got a group right here of them. Isn't that right, guys? You know that's right. Um, to say that, because you see, I knew that he had just bought a new black Lincoln. And you know, poor boy there in the hills, goodness gracious. So I said, Bruce, he said, whatever you want, Joe. I said, I want your new car. And he looked at me and he said, you can pick it up in the morning at the office. And the hallelujah chorus broke out. <laughs> Actually, I went by his office the next day and he flipped me the keys of that new Lincoln. I got in that car and I drove all over the community all over the county for every Baptist minister I knew. <laughs> and I'd pull up in front of the church or the house and blow the horn and say, look what the Methodists are doing today. <laughs> you like John Wesley? You know, I... But it changed them. God's in the business of changing people. I want to read a letter that we got recently. A short letter. Dear Pastor, I pray this letter finds you and your church blessed with being God-centered. All praise and glory be to the creator of the universe for his grace and mercy through the salvation that came from his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. In 1989, I walked in your church broke open a cabinet door and took some money out of a cash box. I believe it was around a hundred dollars. I pray that you forgive my trespasses and accept this money and my apology. I'm sure I should give back at least four times the amount. That will have to wait until I get out next year. Please pray for me that God will continue to give me wisdom of his word. I just think, our Lord, that he is in the forgiving business. God bless you in Christian love. And he signed that it came from prison. He obviously had met the Lord, and he obviously had been set free to give. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? So it demonstrates our faith. And finally, generosity is a deposit in eternity. Listen to this uh, scripture from 1 Timothy 6. Tell those who are rich not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which will soon be gone. Tell them to use their money. You get that? Use their money to do good. You see, we use money. It's a tool. That's all it is. It's a tool. We use money. We love God and we love people. But we use money. It's a tool. It's not the opposite. You understand that? We use money... We love God. We love people. That's what he's saying there. They should give happily to those in need, always ready to share with others whatever God has given them. And by doing this, they will be storing up real treasure for themselves in heaven. It is the only safe investment for eternity. Wow. He says, tell those who are rich. Aha, tell them, Joe. Well, listen, that's us. Listen to this. I found these statistics. Half the world lives on less than $2 a day. One billion people live on less than $1 a day. One billion. In, your, in Rwanda, the average income is 67 cents a day. If your children have any change in their pocket, they are among the world's 5% wealthiest people. If you have any money or change in a cup at home, you're wealthier than 95% of the people in the world.
That's unreal. In the last book of the Bible, which is Revelation, as you know, in chapter 12 and verse 10, it says that the old devil the, uh, is the accuser of the brethren. And, and in verse 11 says, and he's defeated by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. It says, in verse 10, it says that he's the accuser of the brethren. In Hebrews 7 and 25, it says, it says that Jesus is the intercessor. That is, he prays for us. In other words, he blesses and the devil curses. He gives, he's generous, and he hoards it up. It's his stuff. He multiplies and multiplies and blesses. What side do you on? When you think of the needs of the world, do you want to be with the blesser or the cursor? The accuser. That's something to think about, isn't it? What if, what if we taught our children how to be generous? What if we taught our children how to be, now think about this. What if we taught our children how to be generous? Remember the bear, 12 foot forward, 12 foot back. Christ offers us freedom. There's, the bars are gone. The chains are off. We're free. Free to bless and give. Free to live the life. About 12 years ago, our nephew, who's a, he's a lawyer up in Indianapolis, great Christian man. He had a little boy born. They've, they've got three children, two girls and a boy. The youngest is a boy. His name's Josiah. And when he was a baby in the crib, our nephew would lean over and whisper in his ear. He'd say, Josiah. Josiah, you're a world changer. Change the world. And, and from that day on to this, 12-year-old boy, he still will speak to him and say, Josiah, you're a world changer. Change the world. What if we did that with our children? You know what Josiah believes today? He believes that through Christ, he is a world changer. And Christ through him is going to change the world. Wow. The final thing I say, and I know I, I, my watch is working too, and it, I've got to quit. So I went so long today. But Jim Harless is here for the first time since I've been here, and he really needs this. Okay. I, <laughs> the final thing I say to you, Generosity will confuse your neighbors. <laughs> Think about it. Confuse your family. Because maybe they've heard our sermons long enough and they need a free sample. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word, Lord. And I know that this church, goodness, First Broad Street, United Methodist Church, gives and gives and gives. And Lord, we just want to thank you with a whole heart for the privilege and opportunity we have to serve you. There's nothing greater than serving you. We see your presence and feel your presence in and through the lives of people all around us this morning. We thank you for allowing us to be a part of what you are doing in today's world. May we realize afresh this morning that we are world changers and we need to go forth now and never drop that belief and change the world. You transform the world through us as we commit ourselves afresh to you in Jesus' name. Amen.